The mic, go ahead. Uh, one question I do want to elevate, uh, given the fact that I had the liberty to speak with many of the uh, presenters, uh, to Chancey. One of the points uh, that I think you had elevated in terms of your narrative was the fact that you were doing assessments on transit projects or transit-oriented development before transit-oriented development became fashionable. So can you speak a little bit to that? And before you do, again, my compliments because of the fact that you were doing this as a college student basically doing assessments without any type of roadmap. So the work can be done. Yes. And so my compliments to you for your ingenuity as a college student in order to be a trailblazer. So if you can speak to that. Well, yeah, I mean, there's so much that I could go on, on but yeah, specifically regarding um, the uh, equitable TOD work, um, when TICC was formed uh, in the aftermath of that needs assessment, and then that included the campaign for Thai Town as well, um, in 98, when we found out that Metro was going to uh, start creating the red line um, in East Hollywood, uh, we went to a city council and planning department, and at that time, I was no longer a college student. I was really the executive director of the Thai Community Development Center, but we went to uh, Metro, and, and we went to city council and planning and said, well, you know, if you're going to uh, put the red line, and this was in 1998 uh, through East Hollywood, um, we need to make sure that the community has input and say uh, in the process and, and the benefits that will come out, come out of this major uh, investment of public assets. And, um, and the folks in East Hollywood are all minorities and immigrants and low income and uh, non-English speaking. So how are they supposed to have any say in, in any of the, um, the benefits or impacts? And so, so um, our councilwoman at the time, uh, Councilwoman Jackie Goldberg, um, found that uh, that, uh, that was a, a valid argument. <laughs> and so she then asked planning to fund TICC and, and uh, have TICC then be uh, the vehicle to collect the data from the community uh, through uh, uh, focus groups and through visioning exercises. And we're talking about a uh, large swath of the community, uh, uh, different segments of the community, uh, the sectors in the community, the businesses, uh, the youths, the seniors, the uh, residents, so Armenians, Thais, Latinos, Filipinos. So we did it all you know, in, in various uh, ethnic communities. And we collect that, all that data, um, qualitative, quantitative, and, and then we presented uh, the vision. And that became the 20-year vision that was adopted by planning, city planning, that became the specific plan called the Station Neighborhood Area Plan. That since 2001, when it was passed as an ordinance, till 2020, when it will eventually sunset, um, governs development around a quarter mile radius of each Hollywood, uh, East Hollywood Red Line Metro stop. And that uh, really, um, uh, as a result, um, sort of down zone that area, but also prevented the gentrification and the displacement and um, made it walkable, uh, focusing on open space and affordable housing and historic preservation and walkability and parks. So, Thank so you. Are there any other questions from the floor? Thank you, Carlton. There's a question in the back. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, my question uh, is for uh, Mr. Garcia. Um, I was uh, wondering if there, are, um, if you have any examples of where a community that has been challenging a federal recipient um, regarding a disparate impact case has been able to successfully rebut a substantial legitimate justification uh, for that discriminatory or that disparate impact. I'm sorry. Your question was whether if we're arguing disparate impact or intentional discrimination. Well, has uh, the target successfully argue we're wrong, or are you saying have we won? Uh, well, has it, do you know of any examples where a substantial legitimate justification has been successfully rebutted? Yeah, um, that's the case of what we won. And this is what I've done since <laughs> 1994. Um, in the MTA case in Los Angeles, a Labor Community Strategy Center versus um, Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. It's the largest civil rights settlement ever, $2 billion. 
MTA agreed to invest to keep the bus system, to improve the bus system countywide and to keep bus fares low. That was a Title VI case. We showed numerical disparities. Um, working poor with limited or not, no access to a car didn't get um, equal bus service, first of all. Second, um, no substantial justification. Third, less discriminatory alternatives uh, and spending on buses versus trains. Judge Hatter entered a preliminary injunction finding um, there were discriminatory impacts and enough evidence to go to trial on intent. And we settled for $2 billion, first of all. Second, um, Los Angeles State Historic Park at the cornfield. In 2001, that was a, I started the city project in 2000 because the work needed to be done and nobody else was willing to do it. The city with Los Angeles and a wealthy developer wanted to put warehouses up on the last vast open space in downtown LA. Um, we wrote to Andrew Cuomo, who was secretary of HUD, uh, and said there has not been proper environmental review under Title VI and 12898. There has to be. And the HUD wrote back to the city saying, we will not issue a penny of federal subsidies unless there's, unless there's a proper review that considers the impact on people of color and considers the park alternative. As a result, we entered into a settlement agreement with the developer and the state of California bought the land to create what is now LA State Historic Park. That kicked off the green justice movement in LA. It led to the greening of the LA River. It led to President Obama coming to Los Angeles and saying those words. Same result, Rio de Los Angeles State Park at Taylor Yard, Baldwin Hills um, Park, the largest urban park designed in the US in over a century in historic African-American LA. Today, you have the US Army Corps of Engineers of all people doing a best practice analysis under 12898, finding, first of all, there are disparities in access to parks based on race, color, and national origin. Second, there are health disparities based on those factors. And third, environmental justice laws and principles require federal agencies to alleviate those concerns. That's without litigation. That's the planning process. National Park Service, same thing for their study of the San Gabriel Mountains and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. That's why we've shifted from the litigation in MTA to working the planning process with the federal agencies. Thank you, Robert. Any other questions from the floor? Right here. Thank you. I'm struck by each of your individual stories and the extent to which a personal dedication over years and years and years of work have enabled you to make first incremental change and then more substantial changes. Uh, I'm an elected official, so in spite of the comment from somebody about how mayors don't listen, you know, to anybody, you, you, the reality is that elected officials, in my experience, come and go, and unless advocates are there over time that transcends those times in office for elected officials, then the continuity is easily lost. And so I wondered if any of you would want to comment on the arc of experience and influence over time in your in your uh, careers or your involvement as you respond please do so in less than a minute <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that's why I made sure that we had the tripartite agreement because in my experience with prior working with prior administrations if it wasn't written down it didn't happen right? So we had the uh, tripartite agreement between the community, the city, and the state ports authority. And we're still going on that process. Uh, I can't tell you a number of times when the city and or the state ports authority try to um, renege on certain aspects of the plan, but it wasn't writing. And, and quite frankly, some of the requirements under the plan, the city um, only uh, implemented under pressure from the community. <coughs> well, that's why we're engaged in institution building, because institution building, um, of course, what means that that um, it will last. <laughs> you know, there'll be something left behind uh, after 
you know, elected officials come and go after, uh, you know, I leave uh, the organization, etc. cetera. So um, we, we really need to invest in sustain sustainability of institutions, and I think that that helps for continuity. Uh, I agree, and, and that's why it's so important that, um, you know, we've been toiling in the vineyards for 15 years on, on, on these issues, but until it's institutionalized in agencies like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the National Park Service and the President of the United States internalize these lessons and make them part of the law of the land and then enforce that law, um, that's critical. But on the other hand, um, it won't happen without impassioned individuals like, like the two of them. And um, I'm very sorry that um, uh, Juanita has, has suffered personally for these victories. But that's typical of any environmental justice advocate in this room. Uh, Bernice, uh, Steve, uh, the staff of the City Project. Uh, I'm a civil rights lawyer. I like to think that I do it for the money and the prestige. <laughs> but it's not like that. Thank you, Robert. Um, as we close out, don't forget we want you to fill out your um, review of the session, the little sheet that's on your seat. I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Typically, we spend our life as practitioners assessing air quality effects, noise effects, visual effects, and the effects of relocation. These are different discipline areas. Don't forget that the psychological effects are just as important. We may call it community cohesion. We may call it social equity. But the direct, cumulative, and indirect effects of the projects that we pursue leave a lasting legacy. What will your legacy be today? We have two books from APA that we want to give away. Um, Fair and Healthy Land Use, Environmental Justice and Planning. I'd like to give one to our last question that was requested by our elected officials. <laughs> I hope it doesn't go against your ethics policies. <laughs> 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 Thank you all for participating. We appreciate your attentiveness, and I'm quite sure the panel will be uh, able to stay around for a few minutes to take questions. Enjoy your lunch break. Can you come give a hand? Sure. <laughs>